Hi, this is Earth Science teacher Tim Martin, and in this video lesson, I wanted to introduce you to how we tell the distances to stars. The question is, why am I on my motorcycle? How can this be a useful tool to help us understand the distance to stars? Well, let's find out. In our previous lesson, we learned quite a bit about the property of stars. We talked about luminosity, size, mass, motion, composition, and temperature. In this lesson, I want to talk about how we determine the distance to stars. Here's a little experiment that you can try. Hold out your thumb vertically, closing one eye. Now cover up the five-pointed star. Now switch eyes. Did it appear like your thumb moved? Why is that? Well, that's what we call parallax, or depth perception. We can look at it this way, diagrammatically with a smiley face. Imagine the smiley face closes one eye and looks at a five-pointed star. It will appear to be the third one from the left. If he switches eyes, closes the other eye, now it'll appear that the five-pointed star is the fourth one from the left. By carefully measuring the perspective, or these angles, our brain computes the distance to the nearby object. The question is, can we use this to determine the distance to other objects? That's exactly what surveying does, using triangulation. Have you ever seen a surveyor beside a highway, or maybe in your neighborhood measuring property? As long as we know the baseline of a right triangle, we measure the other angles precisely, we can determine the length of the other sides. For this example, if we know the distance between C and B, and we very carefully measure angle A, we'll be able to calculate BA and CA. So if this is how surveyors measure property and measure land, could this same technique be used to measure the distance to stars? Well, we need to talk about baselines. The distance between our eyes is not sufficient to see parallax for stars. So how far apart could we get our observers? Well, about the furthest possible would be from one side of the Earth to the other. Now, the same person won't be doing that observation, but maybe we could have a telescope at the north and the south end of the planet. Unfortunately, this won't work. A baseline of the diameter of the Earth, or over 12,000 kilometers, is not sufficient to see parallax to nearby stars. So, can we get a bigger baseline? Well, it turns out the Earth does go around the Sun. In fact, six months from now, you will be two astronomical units, or nearly 300,000 kilometers away from the spot you're currently in. If we could measure this angle, maybe we have a chance of measuring the distance to stars. It works something like this. Now please understand, this diagram is not to scale, but on the left we can see the Earth orbit around the Sun. Let's take a picture of the stars. The five-pointed star will appear to be the fifth one from the left. Let's wait a few months as the Earth makes its orbit around the Sun. If we photograph the stars again six months later, now it will appear that the five-pointed star will be the fourth one from the left. How do we know it's the Earth that moved and not the star? Well, truly, six-month parallax is going to require a whole year. We need to wait until the Earth returns to the spot in January to confirm that the star returns to its original position. If it does, then we know that that motion was all apparent motion due to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Once we measure that angle, we then can do a little math to determine the distance to the star. We set up a basic proportion. We measure the parallax angle and compare that to 360 degrees, or the degrees in a complete circle. That will be proportional or equal to one astronomical unit compared to the circumference of this enormous dotted circle. This circle, like any others, the circumference is equal to 2 times pi times the radius. In this case, the radius of this enormous circle will be the distance between our solar system and the star. It's worth noting that the next closest star beyond the Sun, Proxima Centauri, has a parallax angle of 0 0.00021 degrees, giving it a distance of over 268,000 astronomical units. You can quickly see it takes very careful tools to measure angles this small. As we start talking about the distance to stars, it's important also to talk about units. One common unit for measuring the distance to stars is something known as a parsec. A parsec is the distance an object would be if it had one second of parallax angle. 
Remember, a second is one sixtieth of a minute, which is one sixtieth of a degree, or one second is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. Another way to think about it is a parsec is three times ten to the thirteen kilometers, or 206,000 astronomical units. Another more common unit for stellar distance is a light year. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers every second. If you kept on going at that speed for a year, you would have covered one light year, or 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers, or 63,000 astronomical units. Six-month parallax may be used to determine the distance to stars if they're up to a limit of about 10,000 light years. So how do we tell the distance to more distant objects? Well, here's where it gets a little tricky. We compare the absolute and apparent magnitude. Using the properties of a star of a known distance, we compare them to similar stars and estimate the distance depending on how much dimmer the star appears. Remember the lights that we talked about in the previous lesson? If I know that both of these are 25 watt light bulbs, I can measure the distance to the dimmer one by measuring the decrease in apparent magnitude. Variable stars are another group of stars that we can use for comparison. Some stars vary in brightness in regular patterns. Their variability depends on size. We compare the period of variability to faraway stars and then can calculate the distance by comparing the absolute and apparent magnitudes. Similarly, we can use the large stellar explosion called supernova to determine distance to very far away galaxies. Some supernova have occurred at known distance. By measuring the apparent magnitude, we may be able to calculate the distance to that far away galaxy. Doppler shift is the last method to talk about from determining distance to stars. Have you ever been fishing or seen something move up and down in the water? Note this fishing float. As it moves up and down, it creates ripples. What happens if the float is put into motion? Watch as the fishing float moves back and forth. Notice what happens to the ripples on the leading edge and what happens to the ripples on the trailing edge. You can see with a stationary source, the ripples go out in rings or concentric circles. But with a moving source, the ripples bunch up on the leading edge and they stretch out on the trailing edge. Just like ripples in water, sound also travels in waves. Ah, remember the motorcycle? A stationary source would give off sound waves in all directions. But with a moving source, the sound waves bunch up on the leading side and they stretch out on the trailing side. What happened to the pitch of my motorcycle horn as I was approaching the camera? The pitch grew higher. As soon as the motorcycle passed, the waves stretched out, the pitch dropped or got lower because the waves are further apart. By measuring the change in frequency or the pitch of the sound waves, we can determine the speed that I was traveling. Now, it's also important to remember that light travels in waves. Although it's very different than ripples in water or sound waves through air, light is ripples or waves of electromagnetic radiation. If we have a stationary source, those light waves will go out evenly in all directions. So we can imagine this similar to the ripples on the pond. Or, if we want to view them in cross-section, we could think about waves like this. On the other hand, if we could put that light into motion and it starts moving very rapidly, the ripples would bunch up on one side and stretch out on the other. Now, with light, if we talk about light that has a shorter wavelength, that actually means the color is shifted slightly blue. If it's stretched to a longer wavelength, the colors are shifted toward the red side of the spectrum. Thus, we talk about blue shift if an object is coming towards us or redshift if the object is moving away. So how do we use this with stars? Well, we measure the spectrum of stars. Here's an example spectrum of a nearby local star. When we measure nearby galaxies and we see similar spectra, we then determine that galaxies must be made of many individual stars.
when we looked at distant galaxies, we saw slight differences. Was that because the stars in distant galaxies were made of different chemicals? When we looked at extremely distant galaxies, we recognized that all the colors of light in those distant galaxies were shifted towards the red side of the spectrum. This helped us understand that distant galaxies are moving away from us very rapidly. Once we determine the velocity of these faraway galaxies, then we can calculate their distance. As it turns out, most of the very distant galaxies all have a very distinct redshift. We now know this redshifting of the distant galaxies is because of the expansion of space itself. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again on another Earth Science video.